Good evening, my name is Holly Sayre, Superintendent of Schools of Carbondale Area School District. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our town hall meeting tonight. I have with me several members of our school community. I want to introduce to you our panel, Ann Videla and Gabe Pigeon, our school counselors. Larry Gabriel, who is known as a specials teacher at the elementary school and our athletic director, but he's going to be moving into a new role as teacher on assignment, which is assisting in more of a managerial role. Aaron Haley, our director and district safety officer. Debbie Perry and Priscilla Bilski, our school nurses. Kim Mihalik, coordinator of transportation. She also helps out in our business office, but she's one of our district's contact tracers. Colleen Sullivan, a teacher of sixth grade. Sue Rudalevich, the Nutrition's Group Manager. And joining us uh, at some point tonight, I'm going to have the opportunity, coming from Scranton, our new elementary principal, Meg Duffy. So, as we return to learning, we have implemented a hybrid model to offer instruction remotely. <coughs> and at a physical school location. We have three cohorts. Cohorts are going to be in group A, which on Monday and Tuesday are in person, and then Wednesday through Friday are remote. A group B, that is Monday through Wednesday remote, and Thursday and Friday in person. And then our group C students that are remote every single day. Our Wednesday schedule, regardless of which group you're going to be in, is going to look like it does right now at elementary. At 8.30 a.m., the classes start. We finish around 12.30 p.m. And then our teachers have been doing a check-in between 1 and 1.15 with students. And then they have small group and coaching opportunities with students in the afternoon. Elementary parents should have received a letter in the mail informing them of the cohort and the transportation information. This information is also available on our parent portal which the directions are located on our website. We're also offering a scaffold return. As you will notice on this slide, on March 8th, we're bringing pre-K and grades two with our high incident classrooms back and cap. And then on March 15th, we're bringing back grades three through six. The Pennsylvania Department of Health has put out communication a few weeks ago about the importance of the best practices on our uh, key in prevention and spread. Uh, this slide should be nothing new to you and should look very, very familiar to our parents and our students. The first thing that they always say is their, the importance of wearing masks. There was a mask order that was put in place on August 17th and then it was updated in November. Everyone is expected to wear a mask with only a few exceptions which we addressed on a case-to-case -case basis. So, check to make sure the masks fit appropriately. Making sure that it covers your nose and your mouth, that it's secure. And if your child forgets or loses their mask, don't worry, we have extras. The bus drivers, the teachers, the nurses, the main office, we all have extra masks. One of the things that also came out in regards to the mask order is that face shields are not masks. So please consider that. In my communication that I sent out earlier on, the letter that I referred to, one of the things that I mentioned is the importance, especially for their younger children, taking and pra practicing wearing the masks. The second thing is our goal is to maintain a minimum of three to six feet of distance in all areas, the hallways, the cafeterias, the classrooms. We've taken and staggered the communal areas, such as the cafeteria. You probably also noticed when you came in today that there's floor stickers to remind us of taking and having that social distancing and the importance of it. It mirrors what is over in the elementary school. The last thing I want to remind everybody is of the importance of hand washing and hand sanitizing. We're going to be encouraging that throughout the day. There's hand sanitizer in every classroom and you will notice that in communal areas, there's bigger containers of it throughout the building. 
each teacher was also given a health and safety bucket prior to the start of school that has cleaning and disinfecting items available in there for their use. Prior to the start of the school year, our staff was trained in COVID-19 best practices. All the staff, the teachers, the support staff, our cafeteria and maintenance, they've received some sort of training on COVID-19 best practices. Our lead utility officer, Scott Mahalik, also was trained on the application of GS neutral pH uh, which is a special disinfectant so if we did have to do a really deep cleaning because there was a positive case we would have that expert in order to do it we also hired extra cleaners in both buildings to provide extra cleaning services throughout the day in the high traffic areas now what this looks like is the door handles the handrails the bathrooms etc they're receiving extra cleaning throughout the day and every evening our custodial staff will be disinfecting and paying close attention to items in the classroom such as the desktops on in an effort to reduce the transmission the district also has scheduled regular checks on air quality and filter replacement and service pro of carbondale has conducted air quality tests in both buildings and the air was acceptable this is a practice that we will maintain. I already mentioned about social distancing and its importance, and others on the panel are going to be mentioning it tonight. And we're going to be talking about several other safety procedures and protocols that are going to be in place. We're, we, what we will do is we're going to try to minimize physical interactions with large groups of students and be doing a few things a little bit differently such as there's going to be less communal supplies there's not going to be containers of pencils sitting out but instead we're going to be having individual baggies of materials for students there's not going to be assemblies for the entire school physically in the gym but we're going to vary it up a little bit by having a virtual dance party at the same time at this time the school nurses are going to be talking about at-home preparation by parents. Good evening. Um, we're asking that you do a daily home screening checklist each morning prior to sending your children to school. And we're asking that you please check your child's temperature prior to coming. And if your child's temperature is 100.4 or above in the past 24 hours, that you please keep your child home and monitor them for further symptoms. And we're asking you to monitor your child for the following symptoms, a headache, cough, nasal congestion or runny nose, a sore throat, body aches, chills, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, shortness of, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, a new loss of taste or smell. If your child exhibits any of these symptoms, we're asking that you please keep your child home and consult with your physician. And also, if someone in your household has any of these symptoms, we're asking that you keep your child home and also, again, monitor them for symptoms and contact your physician. And if someone in your household tests positive for COVID-19, obviously, we're asking to keep them home, monitor them, and please notify the school nurse as soon as possible so we can begin contact tracing. And now uh, Mrs. Bilski is going to talk about the procedure of the health offices if your child gets sick during school. Good evening, everyone. Just uh, an idea of what will happen when uh, your child gets, has, uh, gets sick in school in the classroom. What will happen is the, the child's teacher will phone the nurse will be set up to greet, your stu greet the student and evaluate them for any signs and symptoms of, of COVID-19. If they have one or more symptoms of COVID-19, they will be taken to, we have in each building, an isolation area 
where they will they will be monitored by the by the nurse or by someone we're going to make a phone call to you and tell you that they they are here with us and um, we're asking that you come within a 30 minute time frame to come and get them it's essential that of course that they leave the building as swiftly as possible there are separate um, exits for these uh, isolation areas and we will direct you when we call you as to what the procedure will be for you to pick up your child um, once you pick up your child you should phone your your family physician your primary care and tell them that you been your child has been sent home and that they have symptoms and your doctor will can further direct you as to what they want you to do as far as taking them for testing or if they just feel as though they want them to be monitored. Unfortunately, their symptoms of COVID-19 are so closely related to so many other things that I can't say with any degree that, that they are positive nor anybody can unless they have a COVID test. Um, Upon their return to school, when once they are either deemed negative for COVID-19 or the doctor uh, says they can return, we'll be asking for a physician's note for them to return to school safely. Um, if there is a positive COVID-19 test, please contact your school nurses as soon as you possibly can so we can begin our contact tracing and um, Keep everybody as safe as possible. As mentioned by both school nurses, after a student is identified of having symptoms of COVID, there is a number of things that will take place in terms of disinfecting and cleaning. The maintenance staff, as Priscilla mentioned, created two COVID labs or stations in both buildings. These COVID stations will keep these children isolated until the parent can arrive to, to properly pick them up. At that time, the director of maintenance will be contacted. Proper PPE will be used and they will be sanitation and disinfecting for the entire room and areas of the high traffic areas. Windows will be opened to include ventilation this has been a process that we have been doing in place since March of last year. As most of you know, this is not new to us. It is new with children being back, but we have been open with essential staff since March of 2020, and these guidelines and protocols have been followed. One of our goals is to be as transparent and disclose as much COVID-19 information, related information that we can as possible timely and meaningful <coughs> if your child is a direct contact to a positive confirmed case you're going to be notified personally by our school nurses if your child is a non-direct contact for example in the classroom where there's a positive confirmed case you're also going to be informed via a blackboard connect telephone call now a situation may arise that we may feel that we need to communicate school-wide communication about a positive case and, and that would be done as well through a Blackboard Connect phone call. For example, when we were notified that a person who was assisting with our produce market in January was COVID positive, a letter went out from the office from me that we notified the public. One of the other things I want to point out, and for those who are sitting in the, in the audience, you will notice at the, the bottom of the screen, one of the things we have also been doing on our website for a, a while now we have been notifying everyone through a contact tracer that informs the public of every positive case we have had. Now, we followed strict confidentiality um, on these individuals. We have not produced names, so we tell building, and then we tell whether it's an employee or a student for those individuals who are testing positive. We did this because we want to assist our families in understanding the status of our schools and our ability to remain open. Dress code, the school uniform. We did make some modifications to our policy for this school year. At any time, your child can wear the school uniform or the gym uniform. 
Uh, the modifications that we made are revolved around shirts, and the, and the spirit wear shirts are fine, collared polo shirts. They do not need to be embroidered, and they can be in any color. The crew neck sweatshirts are also acceptable in red, blue, and gray, and do not need to be embroidered. Uh, our, our policy is on, on the pants, the sports, the, that has not changed, but the modifications really revolve around our shirts. Uh, one of the things I also want to point out, the PTA does have a uniform exchange closet, so if parents have a need, please contact Dory LaSavage at our elementary building and we will assist. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to our counselors. Um, I'd also like to add to the uniform part, if anybody has any uniforms that your students have outgrown that are gently used, please let us know, please donate them to the uniform exchange program. I, I know that we're running a little bit low on certain sizes, so if you do have something, please, you can just bring it over to the elementary school and drop it off there and we will get it to the appropriate people to be distributed. Now, Mrs. Pigeon and I are going to talk about the logistics of the day, which um, has changed quite a bit this year, given the situation. If you noticed in your letter and online, the start and dismissal times for the elementary have changed. The start time for school, while it had been 7.40 technically, buses were dropping off earlier than that in previous years because we were utilizing the gym and the cafeteria as places for the students to wait until the bell rang to go to class. And given the um, difficulties and, you know, we don't want to put that many students together, we are not utilizing those spaces this year. So students are not permitted in the building until 740. If you noticed on our district website, I believe are the bus pickup times at the bus stops. They are quite a bit later than they had been previously because we're trying to time it out so that the buses aren't also sitting at the back of the school with the students on it. So we're trying to limit their time sitting on the buses and have the ability to drop them off almost as soon as they get there. So please make sure that you check your bus, bus stop pickup time because that is different than last year. The students will be arriving or allowed in the building at 740. Buses are still going around to the back of the school and they are coming in the back door near the uh, music room where they always had. Walkers are coming in the front door again. They're not allowed to come in until 740. We are going to have staff positioned outside and I know Officer Haley will speak to this a little bit, um, but students are not going to be permitted in the building until 740. They are all going directly to their classrooms so that we're limiting the amount of exposure um, to other students other than the ones in their rooms. Now, if you have a late arrival, that ha has always seemed to be an issue where we would get a backup in the office. We are saying that if you arrive late to school, we're saying eight o'clock, they need to be signed in by a parent at the elementary school. So if you're dropping your student off and it's eight o'clock, you're going to need to escort them to the building. You'll go to the front door, ring the bell, and one of the secretaries or an office staff person will come out and you'll have to sign them in at the front door. You're not coming in, but they'll, they'll have a station right in the foyer for you to sign your student in as tardy. So the process, it's a little bit later than normal. The process is similar, but we're just not permitting all those visitors into the office to sign them in. Okay, and for, for parents who um, wish to dismiss their child early for a doctor's appointment, say, we're asking that you come no later than 1.30 to dismiss your child early, to sign them out. Um, this is just so we avoid, again, that, that backlog in the waiting room. We don't want parents crowding in there and waiting for their child. Uh, we also ask that you notify your child's teacher if you'll be picking them up early and notify the office. Uh, at some point during the day before you come to pick them up. Dismissal, uh, dismissal starts at 1.45 um, with pre-K and students who will be riding special transportation vans. Um, at that point in time, we will begin dismissing buses. <coughs> uh, we're staggering those times so that students are not all in the hallways all at one time. 
we will be asking the students to remain socially distanced through the hallways um, on their way out to the buses we'll have staff in the hallways making sure you know students get where they need to go they find their their door they need to go to that they stay socially distanced um, and then at 155 walkers will be called for dismissal teachers will as in years past teachers will bring their students down their, their walker students down to two front doors um, the main office door will be for kindergarten through second pre-k through second um, and then if you're looking at the school the door to the left will be for grades three through six so parents can wait at the appropriate doors we ask that you stay socially distanced and wear your masks if you're picking your child up and our goal is to have all students dismissed completely by 205 so parents please um, if you're picking your child up um, please get there before 205 um, the Walker dismissal will be the same as always so officer Haley is going to talk a little bit about arrival um, that's going to look different but in years past um, and this year we will do dismissal the same for walkers um, so no traffic pattern changes parents can find a parking spot and then walk up to the door to come um, collect your children at the end of the day Anything else? good evening everyone so what we're going to talk about is the new traffic pattern for the elementary students coming in in the morning um, the pattern didn't change drastically but what has changed is we're going to try to eliminate three rows we're going to try to minimize them down to two rows um, with that being said if you look at the map behind me we're going to start with pre-k to second grade you guys are going to be the parents there are going to be dropping off their students right at the top in front of the school building um, again it's pre-k to second grade um, this is giving you guys the advantage of getting your children out of a car seat or a um, booster seat putting their backpack on give them a hug and then put once they get to the curb we'll have a student escort walk them right to the building the reason for this is we're trying to get the flow of the vehicles to move swiftly off out of the parking lot and your kids gonna get into the building um, safely with our student escort again if you look at the map and again we're looking at the two red arrows you're going to utilize the second lane and this would be for the third graders to sixth grade parents and this is going to be the lane right where the steps are and we're going to try to utilize this just for those students that are being dropped off um, and again these are for kids that are probably not going to be in booster seats or car seats so if they can exit the vehicle they'll know where to walk just like in the past um, if you have a pre-k student to second grade student and let's say a third grade student or fourth grade student with you you're priv privileged to come up to the top with the pre-k to second grade pit drop off you don't do not have to drop them off at the bottom um, where the steps are um, there's really nothing else that has changed um, as far as the like you said we're going to keep the walkers the same um, nobody's allowed up top in the afternoon um, just find a parking spot and there's going to be signs posted outside for um, social distancing um, and wearing your mask on our property when you come on and I think that's about it hi everyone my name is Sue Rudolavich I'm the new food service director here at Carbondale area I'm happy to announce that Katie Gillespie has moved on. She's a hometown girl. She's been with you for the past five years, and she has moved on to a regional manager position with the nutrition group, and we're, and we're thrilled to have her in the new position. So as part of, a, a, of our commitment, we are following the CDC guidelines and necessary protocols as we navigate through the opening of the schools. Our food service staff has been trained and will be continue to be trained as new information is updated and as it is provided to the food service management companies. So what do you expect? For breakfast, elementary schools breakfast is going to be in the classroom. It is going to look a little bit different than it did last year. Last year, they were congregating in the hallway, going through the pods, picking and choosing what they want, and then going to the classroom. 
this year breakfast will be delivered directly to the classroom and the teachers are going to assist in passing out the meals and making sure that there is a variety of items for the students to choose from. Lunch is going to be the same. We are going to follow the necessary, necessary social distancing throughout the cafeteria and also through the cafeteria line. Seating will be arranged a little bit differently as the cafeteria will maintain social distancing. There will be a variety of options, both hot and cold, along with fruits, vegetables, and milk. A la carte, a la carte is still available to the elementary students. It is, again, going to be handled a little bit differently. We are operating a cashless system. So what that means is that the students will no longer be handing the cafeteria staff cash in the line. You can put money on the account of on NutriKids, My School Box, which is provided. And you could get that information on the school webpage, or you can put money in an envelope with your child's name and ID number. The teachers will collect it and send it down to the cafeteria, and we will put it on their account. As the student comes up to pick up a bag of chips or cookies or, or a bottle of water, they will tell the register person their name and we will draw the, from the account that way. Pin pads will no longer be used because that is considered a high touch area. Hybrid to go. We realize that the students will only be in school for two days. We are going to provide five meals breakfast and lunch to all the children in the schools. Meals are free to all students. So as the students leave on Tuesdays and Friday, they will be bringing home five days worth of meals. We hope you enjoy them. Virtual meals will be distributed on Wednesdays from two to three. We are no longer going to be having a meal distribution on Mondays and Thursdays. It will be moved to Wednesdays while the students are not in the buildings. Additional information, allergies. If your student or if your child has an allergy, please contact the nurses. The nurses are going to send us the necessary information and we will make the dietary arrangements as dictated by the, your family physician. NutriSlice is available through the webpage. You can look at the menus. You can find the dietary nutrients available. If you are in need of any of that information, you can always contact me and I can help you navigate through that. That's it. That's about it. Okay, I, I have one thing that I'd like to share with parents in terms of our schedule for lunches. It's very similar to what we had in the past in that first and second grade will be going to the cafeteria together. All the grade um, bands will stay together as we had them previously, but we are staggering the times that students are going into the cafeteria so that we're not having a lot of students congregating in the halls waiting to go in. We're just crossing paths. So let me give you an example. First grade will be going into lunch at 1035. They will have their 30 minute lunch. Second grade will be going into the cafeteria at 1040. They will get their 30 minute lunch. Um, when they're done, when the kids are all finished, we're asking them to exit the cafeteria as soon as they're done. So they might be finished before that because in all honesty, it doesn't take them a half an hour to eat. They're usually finished eating, but as soon as they're done, we're going to get them out of the cafeteria in order to give the cafeteria staff enough time to clean and sanitize the tables. They need at least 10 minutes between our lunches to appropriately clean and sanitize the tables for the next group. So I want everyone to know that we have staggered and spread them out so that everything is sanitized before the next group comes in. Good evening. We were very cognizant as a committee of the many benefits of the elementary age, such as 
students becoming less fidgety or more on task. Students improve their memory or focus their attention. Uh, they tend to develop more brain connections, um, learn negotiation skills, exercise leadership, teach games, take turns, and learn to resolve conflicts, among several other benefits. With that being said, it was a priority of ours to make sure that recess stayed in our daily elementary schedules. Uh, students will have the opportunity to hand wash or sanitize on their way out to recess and then when they come back inside. Um, when students are outside and we could enforce social distancing, uh, this could be utilized as a mask break. Students will be able to take off their mask while they're outside, maintaining the appropriate social distance. When they come back inside from recess, we will have uh, a hand washing opportunity or hand sanitizer available. Uh, during the recess time, unfortunately, the many high contact surface areas we have, such as playground equipment, we will not be able to utilize because of our inability to effectively clean and sanitize those things. But our teachers will be able to come up with other ways for students to play games and exercise outside at recess. In the event of inclement weather, um, we will be using multiple classrooms. In the past, we would combine two classes and there'd be roughly 35 to 40 students in a classroom during an indoor recess. That will not be the case this time. If there is an indoor recess, students will be reporting back to their own classroom and they will be monitored in their own class. First, I'd like to thank Mrs. Sayre for inviting me to this town hall this evening to provide some information um, to the public and the parents and the guardians. Secondly, I would like to um, have a wel warm welcome for Ms. Meg Duffy. I think she's gonna be a great addition to our administration team. With that being said, as Mrs. Videla mentioned earlier, there is a bus list that has been added to the district website also to all of the social media platform. Please look at it because things have changed. Times at bus stops for AM have changed and the elimination of bus number 23. All bus stops will still remain the same. Only times will change. The elimination of bus 23, bus 00 will be taking on Park and Ninth. Bus 10A will be picking up at Park and Salem. Last week, a transportation memo was created and sent to the principals and all the stakeholders of all of the people that are involved in the safe transportation for our students. This transportation memo outlined all of the guidance put forth by the Department of Health, Pennsylvania Department of Education, CDC, the Center for uh, disease and, and control and prevention, as well as our own health and safety plan that was worked on amongst all of us here on the panel. The outline of the transportation memo really focused on the disinfecting of the buses, wearing masks, loading the buses from the back to the front to avoid exposure, keeping the first seat behind the bus driver available and empty, and, to, and all other safety precautions to take when their children are riding safely on our buses to and from school and our vans. PPE has been provided to JW Transit Incorporated as, as well as a few other transportation providers that we do utilize. <clears throat> Lastly, with transportation, bus monitors. Bus monitors play a very important role on the buses. The primary role that we're going to use them for this year is to ensure that there are assigned seats and the social distancing is being adhered to. Masks are being adhered to. And then most importantly, to make sure that there is a parent or guardian at the bus stop to safely dismiss the student at the end of the day. For those of you that do not know where to locate the bus schedule, if you go to the district website, Click on community, under community is forms. That's where you will find the communication for the bus schedule. Finally, my contact information is also listed on the district website. Please email or contact me 
with any questions or concerns. Thank you. Good evening. On behalf of the faculty at Carbondale Area School District, I would like to express how excited and we eager we are to welcome your students back into the school building. I'm going to begin by discussing the layout of your student's classroom, or your child's classroom. As you can see from the photo, classrooms will have students' desks labeled by cohort, cohort A or cohort B with an empty desk in between. Based on CDC guidelines of three to six feet, we will maintain six feet as much as possible. Live instruction. Hybrid students will be arriving at 740 and virtual students will log on for a 755 for the National Anthem and Pledge of Allegiance. This will be the start of the instructional school day. Hybrid and virtual instruction will be simultaneous, meaning the students in the classroom and online will be given the same instruction at the same time by the same teacher. Teachers will be delivering the same core curriculum to all students. The teacher will present the lesson, provide guided practice to the students, then the students will be given independent work to complete. They will also have special schedule throughout their daily schedule, as well as a 30 minute lunch period and a 30 minute recess. During that time, virtual students would not need to be logged on. Bus dismissal will begin at 1.49 and virtual students will be dismissed at this time. All lessons will be continued to be recorded for virtual students to view at a later time if needed. On Wednesday, the schedule will look exactly as it is now. Our day will begin at 8.30 and end at 12.35 with the afternoon for small group instruction. With individual supplies, student supplies will be packed in a Ziploc bag labeled with their name for daily use while within the classroom. Material distribution for online students will remain the same as it has been in the past. All teachers were provided a container with cleaning supplies to sanitize any materials or surfaces the students come in contact with. This will be done frequently throughout the day in the classrooms. Students will be able to use desks and lockers. Lockers will be staggered based on the cohort, cohort A or cohort B, as well as the classroom desks. Students will also have scheduled bathroom breaks throughout the day. We are also encouraging all students to bring their own water bottles. A water cooler will be available in all buildings for students to use because we are not incurred, we will not be using any water fountains. Next, Mr. Gabriel will be discussing volunteers and visitors. As you would likely expect, we are going to be limiting access to our buildings um, to essential personnel only. Unfortunately, we will not be able to allow volunteers at this time in the elementary building with the exception of our uniform closet. Um, if a situation arises where we find we need volunteers, uh, that will be an administrative decision with uh, Superintendent Sayre and Principal Duffy to make that decision. Um, however, there's going to be um, a necessity for certain visitors to enter our building like those that provide services to our students. Um, also, we may be scheduling meetings such as IEP meetings or 504 meetings, child study meetings. They can be held in person um, or virtually. Now, any visitor that is going to be entering our building will be screened upon entering our buildings. We will be utilizing the screening checklist that our nurses referenced earlier provided by the CDC and the Department of Health. Okay, so as we are all well aware, um, March 13th of last school year was the last day that our students were within the four walls of our elementary school for in-person instruction. So that's a full year that we've been without them and they've been without us in person. Uh, so this transition back is a really big deal. Um, it's a big deal to us, but it's a bigger deal to them. Um, we're recommending that parents speak with their child or children um, about what their day might look like. It will look different. Um, it will, we'll have different routines, we'll have different expectations of them. But explain to them that it's to keep them safe and healthy and to keep the teachers safe and healthy. If your parents stay positive, the kids will stay positive. You know, 
know, ask them when they get home, how was your day? Keep an eye out for, they might be emotional. They might be um, a little bit anxious and it's okay. Um, just talk them through it. Um, when they get to school, um, actually before school, teachers have our PBIS lessons um, already and they're gonna be going over them this week with the students in their classroom. What that is, is uh, we're teaching them our expectations for when they're in the building, for their behavior, and we've added some safety lessons in. Um, hand washing, social distancing, uh, what all of that will look like. And then when they get to the building, they'll be practicing that in person with each group of students. We also uh, made a video today for our pre-K and kindergarten students. Um, kindergarten students, you know it's been a year since they've been in the building and our pre-k students have never been in the building so we made a video of um, walking into the building the faces that they will see when they walk through the door uh, it's actually a really cute video mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we think it'll be helpful for them so parents if you could watch that with them talk to them about what it might look like when they walk through the door and keeping in mind that in a typical year we had permitted parents to walk our kindergarten and pre-k students to their classroom and that's not permitted this year which is one of the reasons that we made the video and hopefully you guys enjoy it as much and and have as much fun with it as we did making it today it was really fun to do um, well that will be out soon we're not technology experts we're trying to figure out how to get it uploaded and take it from our phones but it will be there soon for you um, now there are some things that if you're noticing that there have been some changes or um, they're happening when they're coming back to school, there are some supports and services that we can provide. We're hearing for the most part that kids are excited about coming back. You know, kids haven't been with us for such a long time that we're not anticipating a lot of separation anxiety but there, it, there, we think that there will be a lot of anxiety around being around so many people and exposure to so many people. Um, if you're noticing anxiety, there are some coping skills and, and some things you can do. First and foremost, we have the advantage of having two counselors available in our building alone. There are counselors at the high school as well. We are assigned to certain grades, but that does not mean that we only work with those grades. We will work with whoever needs us at the time. There's also a district social worker who's available if a student needs maybe more than the two counselors can provide. Um, we also have information about our student assistance program on the district website. We have a team that works with that. If a student is experiencing some significant difficulties, we can refer to the SAP team and that can come through a parent, it can come through a teacher, or even a student referral, which doesn't happen very frequently at the elementary school. Um, but it is, it is possible for an older student to do that. Now, in terms of coping skills, there at the bottom of the slide, I have a link. And I know we're going to try to share the PowerPoint with everybody. On that link are some coping skills for students. And the, the initial link is for helping to calm anxiety. There are some really great ideas that are quick. There are some other things that are going to take a little bit more time, but some of the quick ideas would be to get a cold drink. That really does help kids calm down to get a cold drink of water. To squeeze something, try deep breathing. We talk about parents using sympathetic language. It's easy for us to get frustrated when our children are anxious we don't understand where it's coming from or even if we understand we think they should just get over it but there are some ways that you can support your kids through that and there are some great resources on that website um, there are other things based on age you know there are some things you wouldn't do with a younger kid but there there's a nice list if you can't access that site please give me a call send me an email I will send you the link directly because it really can be helpful if you have a student who's experiencing anxiety and there are other resources for students experiencing anger, um, stress, really great resources there. And I know that you know we're getting close to time, so I'm not going to go into this a whole lot. This is a slide that talks about um, what to do if your child is worried about coronavirus. And there are a few on there that I really want to stress for parents. 
limit news exposure as much as you can. They don't need to hear the daily count like we're hearing every day. We're getting alerts on our phones. That's an adult thing. Be mindful of your own worries and your conversations when you're around your kids because they hear and feed off of everything that you say and do. And you might not think that they are, but they truly do. There are some techniques, controlled breathing, um, just be mindfulness exercises. There are things, you know, resources that you can use on that other site that will help if they're truly worried about coronavirus. So if you or your child, you know, you're looking for something, please reach out to Mrs. Pigeon or myself and we can definitely help you with resources for that, as well as being right there with the kids when they return. We're excited to see them and help them through. So what is going to influence the district's decision to close the school? You know, I understand that a concern of the parents may be at school not having the in-person instruction. So it's going to be really important for us as a community to monitor our health and, and stay home when we're sick, like several of the panel members have already talked about here. Um, one of the things that we do is we do call the Department of Health frequently and every single time we've had a positive case. So we will continue to involve the Department of Health in our decision-making process. Throughout the process, we've also talked to Dr. Morrow and some of the others, uh, community leaders that are in the medical field, uh, to get them, get their advice and use them as a resource for us. We're also, also gonna consider the number of positive cases in the building. Uh, one of the other things that we take and we look at weekly, if not every other day, is the Pennsylvania Department of Health COVID dashboard. We look at specifically the positive rate and the incident rate within our community. And we're always looking to follow any guidance and recommendations that are coming from the CDC or the Department of Health. I mean, just as recently as yesterday, there was a change in the travel restriction guidelines. Those were eliminated. So there's a lot of different data and information uh, that we collect and we use to make our, our decision. So. Uh, and, and just in, in closing the school, one of the things, if we have to do that, we will try to communicate that out as timely as possible. Because we also understand that, especially at the elementary level, parents might be looking to get uh, babysitters and somebody to watch their children. So before I open it up to questions, I do think a lot of people that are online, they provided some questions to us today that we have catered a lot of what we said towards those questions. Um, our principal, who is going to be uh, coming in hopefully as soon as possible, is here, Meg Duffy. If you can stand up and maybe you can just introduce yourself to the public. Uh, she is uh, being held right now by her, her current school district, so I don't have a release date to tell you, but maybe you can just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself before we start questions here. I didn't realize. <laughs> there you go. Um, I do have an open door policy. Any concern that you have is my concern as well. So I look forward to supporting you and your children at Carbondale Elementary. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Duffy. All right, before we conclude here, does anybody uh, physically here have any questions? Does anybody in the panel want to add anything on, on anything that was said? Howie, I was just texting a question and I forgot to bring it up in my part. Um, yes, you are allowed to drop your kid off, like walk them up to the, the front of the school. If you're going to do that, we urge you to find a parking spot that's closest to the front of the elementary school, which is just by the steps there. They're there for you to drop off your kid if you want to park the car. But we're encouraging you to use these traffic patterns, um, especially pre-K to second, to get up to the top of the school there. You're right next to the curb. There, um, there's really no reason to get out of the car, uh, or I'm sorry, to park your car way down low and then walk your child always up when you're already granted the opportunity to be up top there. I also wanted to remind um, staffers and parents who do want to do that, um, please be conscientious now that we're utilizing the top 
of the school driving um, the traffic lane there when you walk up from the parking lot wherever you do park even the, the teachers the pairs um, just please watch the cars coming down the ramp from the front of the school now because a lot of the the teachers and the students and the parents do walk up that ramp I ask that you please utilize the stairs that are uh, below that um, traffic lane to walk up your uh, child up to the front of the school again we're gonna have student escorts there they're gonna be wearing these orange vests and they will walk your child from the curb the curb um, to the front door to ensure her safety or his safety this way you can just stay uh, within your vehicle or by your vehicle and then get in your vehicle and leave all right does anybody else from the panel have anything one thing uh, mrs. Sarah I'd like to add is being the direct contact with the Department of Health um, over the past 10 months um, the district one thing they praise the district on is being consistent consistent with their guidance and their recommendation and consistent with the way that we are treating any um, direct exposures um, or COVID plus cases and I think that's important to notice um, and to note we have received feedback from both uh, parents and employees who have been uh, dir contacted directly by the Department of Health and they have provided that feedback as well and I think that's important for the community the parents uh, faculty and staff um, to really understand that this is an ongoing communication with the Department of Health we had an issue last week that not only went to the Department of Health but to their partners um, at the epidemiologists all the way up to the state level of Department of Health um, they really take concern and immediate attention in anything that's related to schools I think that's important to note thank you you know I'd, I'd like to say thank you to those of you online uh, but also those of you who showed up uh, I recognize faces and I know one of the things over the past seven months since I've been here you've reached out to me with questions and you've provided information on on things and, and points of view and I thank you for that so please continue to to keep on reaching out because we're all in this together and we do want to have the best possible product for our children here in the school district so thank you and have a good night and safe travels home. <laughs>